All right, uh, let's get started. So um, today we will talk about uh, gradient descent and gradient boosting. So gradient boosting is basically the last one of the models we'll talk about uh, for now. And uh, then the next couple of weeks we'll talk more about uh, model evaluation and understanding models. Before we talk about gradient boosting, I wanted to um, do sort of a quick reminder on gradient descent. Um, who here is familiar with gradient descent? Okay, yeah. So it's actually a reminder, good. Um, so the idea is, uh, in gradient descent, we want to minimize the continuous function that I call capital F here. And I gave an example of the uh, famous gradient function here. And so gradient descent is a technique to minimize a continuous function or, uh, by using the gradients of the function. So we start at some initial point that we usually call like uh, W0, if W is the parameter, and we take uh, steps in the direction of the negative gradient. So the idea is that um, wherever we start, if we go downhill, we'll end up at a minimum. In general, this is a local minimum. If the uh, function is convex, this will be a global minimum. So if the function is convex, that basically means there's like um, a single global optimum that can be reached from everywhere. Here's an example showing what this might look like on this brain function. So here we initialized up here. Um, and so at this point we compute the gradient, the gradient points in this direction. And so there's uh, always, there's a learning rate that I called uh, eta i here that says how big a step we want to make at each step. And uh, given that this, like, sometimes this is a constant that's the same for all steps, or sometimes um, you want to vary the step size to be decreasing. And so we go direction, uh, a step in the direction of the gradient. We end up here, we compute the gradient again, the gradient points in this direction. Again, we go the direction, uh, we go a step in the direction of the gradient and so on. Uh, we can see here that as we get closer to the minimum, actually the, the errors become shorter because the gradient becomes, um, becomes smaller. So here for this image, I use the constant step size. And um, so then we end up with a local minimum. One of the tricky things about gradient descent is that uh, is picking the learning rate. So here are images for picking different constant learning rates. So in the image before, I picked the learning rate of 0.1, and that actually works quite well in this case. If you pick a learning rate that's very small, you will make very small steps, and so basically you'll never get anywhere close to the optimum, or you have to wait a very long time. If you pick a learning rate that's too large, you might make a uh, quick initial progress, but then in the end, you will not converge to the optimum. You will just jump around the optimum. And so in general, it's not entirely clear how to uh, pick a learning rate ahead of time. So a common scheme is to set the learning rate to something like um, 1 over t, so it decreases over time. And so you make more and smaller steps. That way, um, you sort of, you're guaranteed to converge um, still sort of the exact rate with which you make it smaller and uh, the exact rate with which you start are still um, so important. So as an example, um, we could use this for um, optimizing logistic regression. So I didn't actually compute the gradient because it's not like, I mean, it's not very hard, but it's also not very pretty. But so um, we could in each, uh, we could start with W uh, say being zero, and then we compute the gradient and uh, for W and for B and adjust uh, W and B iteratively. The stochastic, uh, sorry, logistic regression 
is actually um, convex, so we'll end up at a global optimum, at least if we have a regularized version. Um, so the standard gradient descent, which computes the gradient and doesn't update, is actually not a very effective optimizer. And none of the models that we uh, talked about and used so far would usually use that. Usually if you understand the structure of the mo uh, model better, you can do better optimization. Um, so, I mean, or you could use a better black box solver. So gradient descent is a very, very simple solver. A better uh, solver would be something that uses also the Hessian or the second derivatives. Um, solver that's very commonly used in practice and you probably saw uh, maybe in the homework if you played around with the solver versus LBFGS. LBFGS is um, uh, somewhat based on, uh, it's a hybrid basically between gradient descent and Newton's uh, algorithm where you're trying to, up, trying to um, compute an approximate Hess, uh, Hessian uh, while you're doing gradient descent. And it's like, it works, uh, usually it works much better than just doing plain gradient descent, um, definitely for convex problems. So we wouldn't usually do gradient descent. Um, there's a variant of gradient descent that is uh, however commonly used with very big data sets, which is called stochastic gradient descent. So instead of computing the loss over the whole data set, we could uh, compute the loss for just a single data point. This will be much, much quicker. And so we might pick a data a point at random, um, compute a gradient for that data point, and then update the point. In practice, people usually just iterate over a data set, uh, pick each data point in turn, compute an, uh, the, a partial gradient, which is just for this data point, basically, and then do the update. In theory, if you sample uh, the data point um, at random, basically on expectation, you get the correct gradient. So it's a stochastic approximation of the uh, actual gradient, but it's much faster to compute. That is sort of what is basically used exclusively for neural networks. In neural networks, you usually use a batch uh, so you use like just a couple of samples, but you don't compute the full gradient because computing the full gradient would be very slow. So if your data set is very large, then actually it might be um, beneficial to not use like a fancy solver, but just use a stochastic gradient descent. Um, in scikit-learn, you can, uh, this is implemented in the SGD classifier and SGD regressor, and you can just, um, use them like you would use any other uh, scikit-learn model. So th these are uh, implement all the linear models. So you can do stochastic gradient descent for many, many models. SGD classifier and regressor implement all the, basically all the linear models. So it imp implements um, linear SVMs, um, logistic re and logistic regression for SGD classifier and basically linear regression for SGD regressor. And then with all possible combinations of the penalties like L1, L2, elastic net, and so on. And so um, if your data set is like hundreds of thousands or millions of data points maybe, then uh, SGD classifier can potentially be much uh, faster than using one of the other solvers. Still, it's a little bit tricky to um, tune the learning rate and the learning rate schedule. Another benefit of this is that um, if your data set is so big that you can't fit it into memory, there's a way to do um, what in scikit-learn is called partial fit. Partial fit is basically updating the model using um, only a chunk or a batch of the data set. So let's say you have a really, really big data set and you can only ever um, load, say, 100,000 samples into uh, RAM but you still want to train over your whole data set. SGD classifier and regressor would allow you to do that by uh, calling uh, basically partial fit with each uh, batch in turn. 
Usually if you call fit in scikit-learn, uh, whatever you did before is completely forgotten, the model is completely reset. reset. If you call partial fit, it will basically remember the state of the model up until then, and then just keeps updating it. So if you call uh, fit on SGD classifier, it will um, basically iterate over the data set until it converges. If you co uh, call partial fit, it will just do a single update for each data point that it receives. And so if you actually want to um, do it until convergence, you have to monitor convergence yourself and potentially loop over the data set. So that's like um, maybe a little bit annoying, but at least it allows you to work on very um, large data sets. All right. I think I said all of this. Um, for most data sets, basically logistic regression, linear SVM, or, uh, or the uh, rich uh, work fine, but um, yeah, for very big data sets, it's worth trying out uh, these two uh, models and see if they're fast. All right, so this was just a um, reminder on sort of how um, gradient descent works and how you could use it with scikit-learn as sort of an introduction to um, uh, gradient boosting, what, which is what we're going to talk about next. So in general, the idea of boosting is to build a model by building an um, ensemble of weak learners. So weak learners are supposedly simple models, but if we put many of them together, we get a stronger model. This is um, an ensemble technique. Uh, ensemble basically just means I have many models that I like combine together. Uh, last time we saw uh, bagging and random forest, these are also ensemble techniques. The difference in uh, boosting is that uh, usually the models are built in a sequential nature. So in random forest, all of the trees are built independently. Uh, whereas in boosting, um, each model you add depends on all the previous models. Usually you try to add a model so that it fixes the previous mistake in some way. Um, so yeah, there's many, many different uh, versions of this, Ada Boost, Gentle Boost, Logit Boost. There's uh, many specialized things for like uh, ranking or yeah, classification and regression, obviously. And uh, there's like a couple of years ago, boosting was really, um, really fancy, so there's like tons of publications on it. Um, I think I just saw that maybe last year people started combining boosting and neural networks, so it's like Unvoke again, but um, yeah. So it's basically, it's like a very fundamental class of algorithms that has been studied a very long time. But the one that I think is most successful, and most, most commonly used in practice is gradient boosting. And so gradient boosting is one instantiation of uh, this idea of combining multiple learners iteratively to get a better and better model. I want to first give sort of a high level overview of how it works and then I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the math behind it. And so gradient boosting is really in a sense the, um, the killer model for a lot of industry and just a lot of machine learning and tabular data. It's probably the most vi widely used model uh, in industry, maybe next to linear models. And so um, it is used that commonly because it is um, very effective and yeah, has very high accuracies usually. All right, so but how does it work? So you let's say you have, uh, let's talk about regression first. It's a little bit easier to understand in the regression case. So let's say um, you have your targets Y, and in the first step, you fit a very simple model, usually a tree-based model. So let's say a tree of depth one or two uh, to your targets Y. I call this F1. So F1 is a very simple uh, tree that I just fit um, to my data set. This tree will not work very well because I made it very restricted. But now, I can uh, look at those residuals, which means the things that I didn't explain. 
So I look at y minus f1 of x. That is basically the part of the target that wasn't explained by f1. And now I can start um, fitting another model, another simple tree that I call f2. And what I'm trying to model is uh, y minus f1 of x. So I'm fitting the residuals. And then I can iterate this and add more and more uh, models. So I get a better and better approximation of my target y. Once I did that, you can basically rearrange the, the equations to have y on one side, and then it tells you uh, y is uh, approximated by basically the sum of all the f's. So y is approximately f1 plus f2 plus f3 and so on. And so you predict the output at, as the sum of all the trees. This is sort of the basic idea. Um, there's a slight modification to this, which is we don't really trust each tree that much. So we, we actually don't subtract all of F1 of X, but instead we use a learning rate uh, similar to gradient uh, descent. And we only go, uh, we only subtract, uh, say, uh, I call it gamma here, gamma times F1 from y, of Y from Y. So at each iteration, we built um, a relatively simple model or a, a small tree and uh, to approximate the residuals of all of the things that we had before. And then we subtract learning rate times uh, this uh, new function from the residual. So let's see how this relates to gradient descent. So here is how you could do uh, linear regression with gradient descent. So the loss in linear regression is just uh, summed over the training data set yi minus, minus the predictions yi hat uh, squared. And so yi hat in uh, linear regression is w transpose xi plus b. So um, the loss that we want to optimize is the sum of i, yi minus w transpose xi minus b squared. And so now we can optimize this over w and b to get our coefficient vector and our uh, bias. Uh, and so we can, can compute the gradient. And I mean, the gradient is basically just, uh, wait, y, uh, yi uh, times xi. And um, then do um, gradient descent. I mean, for linear regression, you wouldn't usually do a gradient descent because you can just solve it in closed form, but this is what you would do. Now, in gradient boosting, we have the same starting point and we look at uh, the squared loss if we we're going to do regression. But instead of uh, optimizing a parametric form, so this w transpose xi, we are basically directly trying to optimize um, the yi hat, the predictions. And so we are applying gradient descent to the predictions. And the idea is that um, this guy over here, the, the gradient of the loss, this uh, we model with a uh, tree. And so um, the gradient in the case of regression is just um, uh, b basically uh, the, the residual. And so um, this is what we're fitting. And this maybe makes it a little bit more natural why we have the, the learning rate there. Here's an example of um, how this might look like in a 1D uh, regression case. So here on the x-axis, we have a feature. On the y-axis, I have a target, and it looks like a, well, a t uh, 10 maybe. And so in the first step, or I, I do one-based indexing this time, 
in the first step, uh, basically here, we're fitting the original function. And so I'm using a tree of depth two that I um, drew here in orange. So in orange, it's a prediction of a simple tree of depth two. Um, now, I multiply that with some learning rate alpha. This gives me basically the prediction I would make in the step one. And then I subtract this prediction from my um, from the original target, which is, which is the new blue points here. These are basically the, uh, uh, well, this is the original target minus the predictions from step one. And so these are the new target uh, for step two. And so I again fit a small tree to it. And then I uh, again multiply this by my learning rate. And then basically I also subtract that from, um, from the original target. And so here on the, uh, on the left hand side, you can see basically the residuals that are a fit. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, how the predictions improve. So on the right-hand side, I always plot the original uh, targets um, y, and then I get my approximation uh, y hat in orange. So here, at the beginning, it's just a tree of depth, depth two, so it's kind of pretty bad. But, that, uh, but then, if I add more and more uh, trees, so here in step nine, I get um, a sum over nine trees. So it's actually, uh, it has like a lot of steps, so it's now, or like in the step function. And so now it's a pretty smooth approximation uh, to the function I wanted to model. I mean, in reality, you wouldn't have nine steps. Usually you would have like maybe a hundred steps or even a thousand steps. But this is sort of what happens in principle. For classification, you can do the same thing. And uh, traditionally, um, or usually people use the log loss. So again, uh, very similar to what we do in logistic regression. So that the top is what you would optimize for logistic regression. And um, again, instead of having a, a parametric form, we try to directly optimize the predictions and we model the predictions by a tree. So that we compute the gradient of uh, if we want to optimize it, we compute the gradient of this expression and we try to fit the gradient. So this is like maybe a little bit less straightforward, but um, you can still do it. Finally, for uh, multi-class gradient boosting, you do what is done for uh, multinomial regression. Again, um, replacing the parametric form you have with just uh, the predictions and we uh, also use the softmax like in multinomial logistic regression. And so um, what we're predicting here is then, or what we're modeling is um, this uh, response that I called y hat c uh, for each class c. So we make, um, we, tr uh, we train one regression tree uh, per class per gradient step. And so because we are modeling um, here these, these continuous response functions for classification, both in the, in the binary and the multi-class case, we're actually using regression trees. So um, yeah, all the trees are in gradient boosting are always regression trees, even if we do classification, because we're basically trying to, um, to, uh, to model this continuous score function that we then push through, say, a softmax. Here's an example that's basically the, the thing that I showed for regression before, just for uh, classification on a synthetic 2D data set. And uh, again, I'm using uh, trees of maximum depth um, two. And so you can see that at the beginning, it's like uh, you only have four terminal regions or like four regions here and uh, in each iteration, we add another tree of depth two um, on basically on top of it. 
and so then um, uh, we get a better and better approximation in each step. All right. Any questions so far? How do you do what? Well, basically, so this was a binary um, task. I look at the log loss um, on the data set. So I basically, I compute the gradient of the guy at the bottom with respect to y hat, and then I fit the gradient with a regression tree, and then I subtract 0.1 times the gradient from my target. And then I push it through a logistic sigmoid to get probabilities. Yes. I mean, it's the sum. Uh, so step one is just one decision tree. Step two is the sum of two decision trees. So it's actually it's the logi so the probability here is a logistic sigmoid of the sum of two decision trees. So we're trying to approximate this y hat and this y hat we approximate in that case as the sum of two decision trees. All right, so um, in the case of um, gradient boosting, adding more trees can lead to overfitting because with every tree you add, you make the model more complex because you like do gradient descent more and more on your training data set. So this is different from random forest. In random forest, because all the trees are independent, uh, adding more trees will not lead to overfitting. In gradient boosting, it can lead to, lead to overfitting. And so, um, and there's a very close relationship between the learning rate and the number of trees. This is basically as in gradient descent. If you, um, if you make smaller steps, so if the learning rate is smaller, you need to make more steps. And so um, in gradient boosting, it's relatively common to use early stopping. So basically, you stop adding trees when the validation accuracy stops uh, increasing. So you keep aside a validation set, and you keep adding trees um, until you start overfitting. So this is yeah, similar to what's done in neural network. Um, and you basically, in terms of parameter tuning, you have two choices because the number of trees and the learning rate, they relate um, like very closely. One way is to say, well, I have a computational budget and say like, I have time to build a thousand trees. So I say, well, okay, I'm gonna build a thousand trees and I'm gonna tune my learning rate so that I don't overfit. That's one way to do it. The other way is to pick a learning rate and say, okay, I'm gonna use a learning rate of 0.1 or 0.01, and then I'm just gonna uh, keep adding trees until I'm overfitting. So I'm using early stopping to determine the number of trees that I'm gonna use. Um, so there's other tuning parameters um, oh, I think I wanted to move the slide later, but um, so basically, usually that you have very strong pruning, and typically that's done my, via max depth. You can also do max leaf nodes, or you could also do any other uh, one, but sort of the traditional one is max depth. Um, you can use ma you can tune max features. Um, by default, it will use all features in each split, and basically you um, you um, reduce overfitting by just having a very small max depth. So small max depth used to be one or two. These days, it's it means twenty. I guess uh, it depends on how big your data set is. If you have um, a million data points, a tree of depth twenty is maybe not that deep. I don't know, but so. Um, 
For smaller data sets, usually it's like maybe less than 10. Um, other things that you can tune are um, row and column sub sampling uh, per tree. So by default, you would also use like each data um, point in for building each tree. But um, you could also do some things similar uh, as we did in bagging uh, by just using a subset of the rows. So usually you wouldn't do uh, actual bagging. You, um, you would sample without replacement and say, well, I'm only going to use, um, say, 10% of my data to fit each tree. There's also a way to um, talk to do uh, regularization, but okay, I'm actually I want to talk about this um, in a couple minutes. So this was mostly sort of standard gradient boosting. I think it goes back to like the the early 2000s. Um, there was like uh, a point in, in like 2015 or 2016 when this um, software XGBoost came out um, that kind of make a big splash because it was like a very, very good implementation of gradient boosting. So XGBoost stands for extreme gradient boosting and uh, they made a couple of improvements um, that really made it uh, much faster and much better. A bunch of these improvements were already known beforehand, but basically they combined everything in a uh, very nice way and they gave a very nice implementation. And so everybody kept using their software for many years. One of the uh, main improvements they made, um, yeah, which again, this was something that was not known beforehand, but wasn't really commonly used before, is speeding up the tree building via binning. This is in principle applicable to all tree building. So you could do this also for random forest or for single decision trees. Um, so for a similar technique would be able uh, to speed up random forests a lot. So the slowest thing in building decision trees is actually finding the best split. If you, so finding the best split at each, um, stage is you iterate over all the features and then you iterate over all the possible thresholds for those features and you compute um, the gain or the uh, impurity criterion. So for gradient, uh, for gradient boosting, the, uh, the uh, gain or impurity criterion would be the gradient that you're trying to optimize. And then you pick the one that gives you the best criterion. And so this is what you do for all trees. Uh, the thing that is expensive here is iterating over all the possible thresholds. And not because there's many thresholds, but because this basically means sorting the data set. Um, and sorting the data set takes uh, n log n times, as you, at least those with a computer science background know. And so if there's a lot of data point and n is big. That's the slowest part because everything else is O of n, so in linear time. And so the idea is to get rid of the step of uh, sorting when trying to figure out all the um, all the possible thresholds. And so a very standard reduction in algorithms to get rid of sorting of anything is binning or discretization. So let's say you have some feature here that I plotted on the x-axis. And so um, instead of uh, sorting it, I can get an approximation of the sorting by discretizing it. Here I um, drew bin boundaries based on percentiles. So I have the point on the very left and the point on the very right. And then I used um, different percentiles so that basically there's the same number of data points in each, approximately in each of the bin. And um, all of the data points in the bin on the left, I represent by zero, all of the ones in bin one, I represent by one, by two, and so on. After I did, uh, I've done this, I don't need to do sorting anymore because I know how many values there are and I know exactly in what order they are in. So uh, 
if I see a two, I know it's in second place. And so uh, binning is actually linear time. Um, so you can scan over it to compute the percentiles. Um, and um, so that's linear time. And then you can just discretize it as also linear time. Then you can sort it into bins. That's also linear time. And so basically, we went from um, n log n to O of n. Of course, you lose something. Because now, we c after we do the spinning, we can't look at all possible thresholds anymore. We can only look at the thresholds that are the at the bin boundaries. So before, if I had all of these data points and I build a tree, I could say, oh, well, I want to split over here, or I want to split over here, or I want to split over here. After I do the binning, I can just say, I split at this bin boundary, or at this bin boundary, or this bin boundary. So this is the spinning makes it an approximation but the approximation makes the algorithm um, way faster. So here is a um, quick example of how this might look like. On the left is a chunk of the iris data set, and then I bin it. Here I think I did um, uh, five bins um, on the whole data set, and so each point is now represented by an integer. And um, actually, if I want to compute for, gra uh, for gradient boosting, if I want to compute the criteria, um, or actually for, for any of the three criteria, you only actually need to count how many are in each bin to compute the criteria. So you can summarize a node just by the counts in each of the bins. And this makes it uh, possible to do, make a very fast implementation. So here is sort of, this is written down as algorithms, so I stole this from the XGBoost paper. Um, basically, th this is the criterion uh, they're using, and um, basically the main difference is that um, here you need to uh, sort all the features, and here you just need to iterate over all the bin boundaries from, um, one to M. The other thing that they did in the uh, XGBoost paper is they include um, the second order of the gradient and a regularizer. So this is actually the, the criterion that they are using, where uh, GI is the gradient um, H, uh, and HI is the Hessian, and so you have, for per if you want to know how good is a, a split, um, you look over the data points in the parent node, so this I, I is uh, like the, the parent node, and then you have the child, child node right and the child node left, and for each of them you sum up the norms of the gradients, and you divide by the sum of the Hessian plus lambda, being uh, which is a regularizer. And um, uh, that basically, um, so now you're doing second order gradient descent, or basically it's you're doing uh, Newton's algorithm instead of just using plain, plain gradient descent. If you do regression, um, it actually doesn't make a difference because the Hessian is the identity for linear regression, um, so th there is no second derivative. But if you do um, classification, then these Hessian terms are non-zero, and so basically you end up with a different objective and a different splitting criteria. I'm not sure actually if anyone did like an exact analysis how much that helps, but this is what people do now. And so, um, and they basically also, they introduce, so lambda here, the way this is formalized is like um, basically an L2 penalty. You could also do an L1 penalty and they also have a formulation for this. But so now um, you have a penalty very similar to what you would have in linear regression or um, ridge regression um, that basically I don't think people would consider it before. <coughs> 
Some other, another change that they um, proposed, which was also known, but basically they, they implemented and pointed out, is what, that they um, use column subsampling, which means basically um, only use uh, a couple of features on a tree basis. So this is sort of similar to random forests. So in random forests, you um, pick the subset of features for each split. Here, what they did is they picked a subset of features for each tree. So basically, for each tree, you create a small data set that you use instead of the original data set, which is both a subset of the rows and a subset of the columns. And they found this uh, prevents overfitting. It also makes trading much faster because you have less data for each of the trees. Generally, I, um, I recommend like reading this paper if you're interested in gradient boosting because they kind of they lay out all the tricks and all the experiences, um, and basically they set a new industry standard with uh, this implementation. So um, because people loved uh, XGBoost so much, we basically added a version of this to um, scikit-learn relatively recently, and it's called HisGrain Boosting Classifier. And so if you look at, so this is a log scale. If you look at the speed of uh, the old scikit-learn, so this, the red is gradient boosting classifier. Um, the green is XGBoost, and you can see that basically we were like exponentially slower. Um, and blue is the new implementation, which is his gradient boosting, um, which is faster. So if you want to do gradient boosting with scikit-learn, you should probably use the his gradient boosting. Um, this plot also shows light GBM, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, in a second. I'm definitely going to be early today. So right now in scikit-learn, there's these uh, two classes, his gradient boosting classifier and his gradient boosting regressor, and the standard gradient boosting classifier and gradient boosting regressor. The main difference between those is the one without hist doesn't do binning, so it does the exact splitting, whereas the hist one does the binning, and so it's much faster. Also. The his gradient boosting classifier is um, single core, so I don't know if you know this, but a lot of scikit-learn is single uh, is single core. Mm, you can do uh, multi-core in several models with like the n-jobs parameter in scikit-learn, but um, if you train like a kernel SVM or if you train the old gradient boosting or if you train a single decision tree, all of them will be uh, computed on just a single core, which is kind of a bit of a waste. The his gradient boosting classifier is uh, multi-core. However, the gradient boosting classifier uh, supports sparse data and has a couple more losses right now. While the his gradient boosting classifier, because it's relatively new, um, we don't have sparse data support there. What we do have is missing value support. So his gradient boosting classifier um, supports missing values directly, so you don't have to do imputation. Um, we also have a pull request on a monotonicity constraint. Uh, maybe a couple words about this. So monotonicity constraint is basically saying that you know that one feature should impact the target in a monotonous way. Say um, we do our house pricing, we know that if a house is bigger, it should be more expensive. We know this relationship to be monotonous. And so we can uh, prevent overfitting by hard coding in our model that we know this relationship to be monotonous. And so um, a lot of people that do pricing like to do this. So this is sort of a very popular feature in industry because very often, you know, um, like if something's higher quality, the price is going to be higher. And um, a lot of things, um, is, I mean, the uh, in what's called hedonistic pricing that works of like 
the properties of a product, you just know what is better. And so these monotonicity constraints are quite important. Or so I am told. Um, and soon, which hopefully means the summer, we'll also have um, su native support for categorical var variables in his gradient boosting, which we don't have in any of the other tree-based models. But in general, probably his gradient boosting is what you want to go with. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the, the other models so, or implementations. So the real famous, the first one is XGBoost. So you can install XGBoost from Conda Forge, for example. Um, you can also try pip installing it, but it might be a little bit trickier. Um, it has a scikit-learn compatible interface because everybody likes scikit-learn. It um, supports missing values. It supports training on GPUs. It supports uh, tr parallel training over a network, over a cluster. Uh, it supports monotonicity constraints and supports sparse data. It, um, it kind of pretends that it supports uh, categorical variables. So if you give it a categorical variable, it will one-hot encode it for you. That's basically what it does. Um, so it doesn't do like the, the real categorical splits, but um, it will encode them for you. And so this is, um, yeah, wi widely used, very good implementation. Um, I'm not sure who's actually maintaining it. So now the, the people who wrote it, I th think are at Apple now, but don't quote me on this, but I know that Amazon has been contributing to it a bunch. LightGBM was published by um, Microsoft. And so initially, basically, they took a bunch of the ideas from XGBoost and then they um, improved them and made things even faster and added some more cool features. And then sort of there was this thing where LightGBM and XGBoost basically tried to outdo themselves. Um, so I think um, the light GBM right now is a little bit faster, but there's probably not that big of a di difference. Again, you can install it from Conda Forge. There is a scikit-learn compatible um, interface. It supports missing values. It natively supports categorical variables. It supports GPU training, network parallel training, uh, monotonicity constraints, sparse data. Um, and maybe I should say both of these um, XGBoost and LightGBM um, are optimized much more for prediction speed than uh, scikit-learn is. So these are done. These are um, these work very well for like very high latency applications. All right. I should have really expanded on these all a little bit more, given that I had more time, but. So then there's another one, um, uh, which is called CatBoost. CatBoost is done by Yandex. So Yandex is like this uh, Russian software empire. Um, and so um, this is CatBoost. It's called CatBoost because it, uh, it's particularly optimized for categorical variables. And um, so if you have a, uh, a lot of levels in your categorical variables, and, or if you have a lot of ver uh, categorical variables overall, this might be um, a good idea. It has also, it has like two algorithmic improvements that are not in the other things, or let's say algorithmic changes that are probably improvements. I'm not sure how, yeah, it's very hard to nail down these things because they're very data set dependent. And so if you have a lot of categorical features, this model will probably do better. So what they do by default is that they use symmetric trees. And so what symmetric tree is mean that at each level, in all of the nodes, you use the same combination of, um, of feature and threshold. And I really should have drawn a picture for this. And uh, I'm going to draw it on the blackboard, sort of video. Maybe give me one second. <laughs> 
So these symmetric trees, um, nope, nope, nope. Okay, sorry. Okay. So they're, they're different. They haven't really been used that much before CACBOOS. Um, they claim they work well, and apparently they work well, particularly for categorical variables. And so if you look at, like, let's have, say we have my fa favorite two new data set, and you have your first split. So if you do your second split, it, uh, normally in trees, they're completely independent, right? So what I could have is in the bottom, I could split like this, and in the top, I could split like this. Or maybe they split on the same feature, but they have different thresholds. Uh, symmetric tree basically means they use the same feature and the same threshold. And um, if you um, if you think about this splitting again in this uh, in two D. If you do another split, it's kind of weird because if you do this split, then okay. it's kind of weird. But uh, but if you have a very high dimensional data set, then uh, this makes a lot of sense. Um, and so this is basically a constraint on the model that they are using. So you could turn this off and you can build normal trees, but they say um, uh, symmetric trees are great for categorical variables. And you could, think, you could imagine if you do the same feature in the same split um, for all the nodes in a given level, it's going to be much faster. Uh, and so they say it's ba basically enforcing symmetric trees can give you like a 10x speed up. Um, yeah, they also have... Um, so we're missing value, GPU training, and monotonicity constraints as the other ones. And um, one thing that's also interesting is the way they treat categorical variables. And I'm not sure if they do one-hot encoding for s if you have very few categories, but basically they do um, a fancy version of target encoding. And I don't want to go into details because I don't have made slides for this, um, but Um, basically, they do target encoding, but they do target encoding on each data point. So they, they have an ordering of all the data points. So you, you shuffle your data set and you order them in some way. And now when you target encode um, a data point, you use the statistics only of all the data points before it. And so each data point will have like a slightly different target encoding. And also, for each new tree that you build, you shuffle the data set so the order will be different. Oh, I'm actually not sure if they shuffle it between trees or between splits. I would have to look that up. But basically, so they have some way to do target encoding and kind of inject some noise into it to, um, uh, to prevent overfitting. And that's what I do for categorical variables. So this together with the symmetric trees are really sort of the, the enhancements that they made. And um, they also have a bunch of tooling like to do uh, interpret trees and so on. So um, depending on your data set, some people would say this is the state of the art. But yeah, it always depends a little bit on um, who you ask. But yeah, definitely, basically, you should probably know about all three of them, and you, it probably doesn't matter, like, extremely much which one you use, unless um, you have like a lot of categorical variables, then this is better. If not, then probably one of the other ones is better, or faster at least. Um, all right. So. Wrapping up, um, so gradient boosting is really something that is like that's super pervasive in industry, and so um, set up the default choice, particularly for pricing problems, um, but generally like everywhere. So I know that at some points um, the Facebook timeline was uh, ranked using 
gradient boosting and Bing ads were placed using gradient boosting um, because there were papers written on this, but you can assume an, at any point everything was driven by gradient boosting. So I know that credit card fraud detection at like a big uh, US bank was done using gradient boosting. Um, yeah, I, I forgot. Basically, um, before people become re super enamored with uh, neural networks, everything was driven by gradient boosting. Now, mostly um, ta for tabular data sets, uh, things are done with gradient boosting. And for non-tabular data sets, things are done with uh, neural networks. So things that people like about it is it's like, it's super fast. In particular, if you use this binning trick, so like in his gradient boosting, XGBoost or LightGBM, or sorry, cat boost should also be up there. Um, Compared to random forests, actually the, uh, they have a smaller model size and uh, they're faster to predict. Because maybe as you remember, like in random forests, we inject a lot of noise. So maybe uh, we only allow ourselves to split on some of the features and so we build very big trees that are very deep and we have to have a lot of them because they're all independent and we want to average them. Um, in uh, gradient boosting, we basically, we b usually build smaller trees and uh, because they de depend on each other, they, um, you need less of them to get a good performance because you're basically always fixing the previous one's mistakes. Um, yeah, typically they're uh, more accurate than random forests, so often they require a bit more uh, tuning. So random forests will just always work out of the box without any tuning. For gradient boosting, you probably need to like, I mean, Actually, most of these have very good defaults, um, but often it's quite helpful to um, tune like the learning rate or the number of, uh, uh, number of trees. So if you have uh, early stopping, maybe it's not that critical. Actually, so for the hist gradient boosting in scikit-learn, we copied the defaults of LightGBM because basically we copied most of LightGBM actually, not XGBoost. Um, and so um, I had someone run this on a bunch of be benchmark data sets and just with the default parameters, it basically beat a whole bunch of very highly tuned uh, models. And so I guess even the default parameters are actually quite good, um, but it's slightly less robust than random forests. Oh yeah, and so the, the very fast doesn't really apply to the old gradient boosting in scikit-learn, because basically it's not very optimized and it's single core. So you can use that, but just be aware it's uh, quite a bit slower than the other ones. All right, so this is basically the end of talking about tree-based models. And as I said, tree-based models are like a really important family of models um, that you should definitely uh, know about and understand well, and you should definitely understand single trees, random forest, and gradient boosting, and how all of these are different. So, um, the reason that trees are so awesome are because they can model non-linear relationships, and they don't care about the scaling uh, of the feature, and they don't care about um, any, non, uh, any monotonous transformation. So even if your distribution is super skewed and you have outliers, the trees will still manage. Um, I said no need for feature engineering. I mean, if you, ha if you know how to build good features, that's always useful. But uh, basically, these um, monotonous transformation of your features or any feature, uh, as, uh, any transformation of single features are often not, not needed. And it can also learn interactions um, without you explicitly specifying this. If you have single trees, um, if they're small, they're very interpretable. So that's kind of nice. There's very few models that you can like um, completely print out and like show. Like that's quite an advantage. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, whenever she, she works at a stock exchange and tries to prevent people from uh, doing high-frequency trading, basically, um, because basically the high-frequency traders are trying to uh, 
uh, rip off all the pension funds. And so that's maybe not the best thing to do. And so um, every time she builds a new model, they have to file paperwork that includes the full model. So I think when I talked to her, she used logistic regression, but basically she has to print out all of the coefficients in her logistic regression and file for permission to use it. And so in some cases, having models that you can actually write down is uh, pretty useful. Like you can never print out a neural network. It's just not gonna happen. Um, random forests, on the other hand, they're usually not as compact, but they're very robust. They're very good benchmark. So um, they just usually work and are sort of hard to beat. Um, whereas gradient boosting, often like if you need really high performance or high throughput, that's usually the model of choice. Um, it's a little bit harder to understand and maybe it's a little bit harder to tune, but um, it's sort of the industry standards in a bunch of applications. All right, uh, any more questions for today? Cool. So um, homework was uh, due today, as you know, and hopefully all submitted. Uh, the new homework will be posted on Monday. We'll also post grades for homework one today. Um, one thing maybe about homework extensions, so I'm happy to extend homeworks if I have a doctor's note, um, but not otherwise. Hope you all feel better. I either speak up or come to the front, please. <laughs>